Um, first of all, I want to acknowledge that Massey College is built on land where many Indigenous peoples have lived. It's on the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, as well as the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat and Haudenosaunee peoples. We want to acknowledge our duty of stewardship toward the land and the great privilege that we have to work here. I also want to acknowledge that acknowledgements on their own don't right wrongs, whether in the past or ongoing, but they're something. I want to thank Massey College for making this event happen and the Chair in Human Rights at the U of T's Faculty of Law for co-sponsoring this event. Most of all, I want to thank our brilliant participants for sharing their time and ex expertise and insight, and in two of their cases, their personal stories on such an important topic. They're so wildly accomplished, I had to truncate their bios, but you can read longer versions on the event website. Audrey Macklin is Professor of Law and Chair in Human Rights at the University of Toronto Faculty of Law. From 2017 to 2023, she was Director of the Center for Criminology and Social Legal Studies. She teaches, researches, and writes in the area of migration and citizenship law, business and human rights, and administrative law. Lama Morad is an assistant professor at the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs at Carleton University. Her research focuses on the intersection of forced migration, local governance, and the politics of borders with a regional focus on the Middle East. She also has an interest in how global institutions shape the politics of asylum and refuge. Murad is writing a book on the local politics of refugee response with a specific focus on Lebanon's policies towards Syrian refugees. Angelica Pesarini is an assistant professor in race and cultural studies slash race and diaspora and Italian studies at the University of Toronto. Her work seeks to expand the field of Black Italia, focusing on dynamics of race, gender, identity, and citizenship. She's interested in the racialization of the political discourse on immigration and she's among the co-founders of the Black Mediterranean Collective. Angelica is writing a book on the lived experience of Black mixed-race Italian women during the post-colonial fascist period in East Africa and the use of oral sources as counter-narratives. And joining us remotely, Alison Mounts is Professor of Geography and Associate Vice Principal of Research and Innovation, Strategic Initiatives and Partnerships at the University of Toronto Scarborough. Her research explores how people cross borders access asylum, survive detention, resist war, and create safe havens. Mounts is currently conducting research on asylum seeking and resettlement in North America and directing Haven, the Asylum Lab. Finally, before we begin, some very brief context. As of mid-2023, 110 million people were displaced worldwide. 30 million people were in refugee or refugee-like situations. They had fled their country of origin. But only by, the, the, by mid last year, only 59,500 refugees were resettled. There were 6.5 million asylum seekers, people seeking refugee protection in countries that do individual refugee, refugee determination. There were 62.5 million internally displaced people. And contrary to the images that we often see and the news stories that we read, 75% of displaced people are hosted in low and middle income countries. Rich countries get away scot-free almost. 149 states, including Canada, are party to either or both of the 1951 Refugee Convention or the 1967 <coughs> Protocol, which define the term refugee and outline refugees' rights and states' obligations to protect them. The core principle of the 1951 Convention is non refoulement which asserts that a refugee should not be returned to a country where they face serious threats to their life or freedom. Now, I'd like to get started. We hear the word crisis so often, the word kind of loses its power. But I wanted to ask, are we in a refugee crisis? And what does that mean? Should I start? Go for it. OK. Um, well, actually, before I start, let me just say it's a real pleasure and honor to be on this panel. Um, I'm thrilled and, and it's a real privilege. But I actually want to take a moment and just say something about Anna as a journalist, because so rarely do we acknowledge the talent, commitment, dedication, and intellect that really good journalists bring to these issues. And I frankly have spent a lot of time over my career talking to a lot of journalists. And sometimes they uh, are, they hear what you say and they're uh, really um, careful and analytical and able to synthesize 
uh, really effectively and communicate to a wider audience, but not always. But I want to just say that Anna is. And so before we go on, I just want to say thank you. For being a good thank you. Um, as for refugee crisis, um, I'll just borrow somebody else's terminology. There isn't a refugee crisis, there's a protection crisis. Okay. And um, although Anna shared with you numbers that are dire, and they are dire because they denote a lot of human suffering, they are not in themselves novel. They aren't episodic. They aren't sudden or unpredictable. This, sadly, is a common feature of the contemporary world we occupy and, if you will, an inevitable consequence of a particular kind of international nation state system that we have. Um, and so one of the problems with calling it a crisis is that it makes it sound unprecedented, unimaginable, and something we could not possibly have prepared for. And that's simply not the case. Um, and just to, in my sort of answer to it, I'll just give you one little example, which is um, the positive example of the way in which Canada has dealt with uh, the predictable uh, flight of Ukrainians, right? It has done it by creating an air bridge where uh, an unlimited number of temporary resident permits were made available and people were able to come as they chose to Canada um, in what you might call an orderly, regular fashion, even though unpredictable. Canada didn't know in advance how many numbers would, how many people would come. So in that sense, it was unpredictable, but it was all managed because Canada chose to manage it. In other contexts where people arrive as asylum seekers, this is depicted as somehow irregular or unsafe or not predictable. But in fact, these are all the products of choices made by states about how to manage situations which in their specificity may not be completely predictable, but as a phenomenon are. And so that's the way I would open up a conversation about whether this is a, a refugee crisis or a protection crisis. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I also want to thank Anna for honestly bringing us together. I'm totally honored to be part of this panel and I just pressed on my mic because I'm not used to having a mic, but <laughs> so apologies to those who are. Um, I mean, I really, the the way in which I think about this is very, runs in parallel to, to what Audrey said. And in addition to a protection crisis, I think it, you, you can describe this as a, a crisis of governance, right? And so it, it's not so much that the numbers in and of themselves are unmanageable or unforeseeable or unpredictable. It's that the tools we have and the ways that we respond to that as states globally and, and also as global institutions have really deteriorated and have become uh, much less uh, built on principles of responsibility sharing and have been much more focused on finding individual state-based responses that respond to particular sets of crises and that are starting to fray at this sense that this is something that needs to be addressed globally. And one of the ways in which in my work I've seen that manifest is this, what you mentioned, Anna, which is the, the greater and greater concentration of refugees that find themselves in the global south, right? And we see this disproportionate uh, balance really increasing more and more since the 1990s. And this is both due to the changing nature of conflict and the increasing numbers of, of sort of protracted civil wars and conflicts worldwide, but also because the numbers and the percentages of uh, refugees and asylum seekers that can make it to the global north have, have continued to, to weaken over time as a percentage. And so it's both a, a crisis in that we can't, you know, of protection that we can't address, that we haven't been addressing the needs of, of refugees and asylum seekers globally, but also it's a question of, you know, what institutions, what mechanisms, what policies do we use to try to address that? And I think one of the things that I, you know, that we're, we hope to talk about today is this sort of shift away from global responses that address global needs to, you know, every state watching out for themselves. So thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. I'm also very happy to be here today and thank you for the audience to be here. Um, I definitely agree. Like Audrey was saying the terminology here is key. Crisis seems something unprecedented or uh, exceptional. In reality, 
in my opinion, is a crisis of whiteness uh, because the refugee crisis is also a racial crisis, right? I think about the central Mediterranean, so especially Italy. And so uh, the institutions, the media frame uh, this event as a crisis, like something that has never happened before. However, if we study the history of the black presence in Europe and in Italy, we can see that it's very, very ancient. However, colonialism here is the key point. We talk about fortress Europe for a reason. And so is what bodies are allowed to come into fortress Europe and what bodies are considered as deviant or alien or not belonging. And we had a blatant example with the Ukraine, right? That was really uh, shocking to see how Ukrainians, because these are not my words, many uh, politicians in Italy, for example, they were saying they're like us, they look like us. And so all the rules that are very strict in terms of immigration and asylum seeking suddenly collapsed. Everything was open. However, we could also see how black people in Ukraine were put at the end of the line. They were not allowed, like the others, to cross and to be safe and to be saved. So it's also a uh, way to tell us how black lives do not matter as much as other lives. And that's why I think, you know, when we talk about Black Lives Matter, I think it's something that we really uh, think in a very different context. Hi, I don't know if you can hear me, Anna. I'll add to the chorus uh, to say I want to share in the gratitude for the organization of this panel that I'm honored to be a part of. And I just want to add to the discussion that crisis is also something that's productive. It adds to the very vitriolic, racializing, criminalizing discourse um, that panelists have discussed. And it calls the attention of all of this discourse over here as a way of really distracting and obscuring the violence that is attached to border enforcement and exclusion. I think there's so much consensus amongst researchers, amongst social scientists, for example, who study border crossings, who study the search for asylum and displacement, that increased border enforcement intensifies precarity. It corresponds with higher numbers of deaths at sea, for example, um, greater border deaths, and there are people all over the world who are documenting these border deaths. And so I think um, it obscures from the violence that is being enacted. It, sorry, it obscures the violence that be, is being enacted by states and therefore um, really takes away from the underlying problem that we need to talk about, which is the retreat of the wealthiest countries from the provision of asylum and the foreclosure on people actually even gaining access to sovereign territory. If this is a crisis of race and protection and governance, is it exacerbating or are we seeing a continuation of an unwillingness to protect? I'll let someone else start. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's hard to, to sort of say one way or another, I think, the way in which mm -hmm the trend is moving because I think as as Audrey said there are these moments right of opportunity like we saw with the, the Ukrainian crisis that show us that you know a possible you know possibilities can can emerge and I think you know the case that I I, I know the most of the Syrian refugee crisis I think really speaks to to Angelica's point earlier which is that so much of this is about racialization and the, the Syrian refugee crisis I think embodied this so much because Really, in you know, from 2012 to 2015, Syrians were seen as non-white, right? Mm -hmm. And the crisis in Europe centered around primarily male and seen as you know Arab non-white bodies. And the image that we most Canadians are probably most familiar with is the devastating image of Ayman Kurdi's body washing up on the shores of Europe. And in that image, what I think was so and, and it came up, you know, also in the language that people talked about, like that was a kid that looked like our kid, mm -hmm. you know, that could have been our kid. Mm -hmm. And there was something about this young boy who was in that moment actually kind of 
racialized as white, right? And moved away from this sort of foreigner, the stranger, the, and, and, it, and it opened up an opportunity, right? And it, and it galvanized people here in Canada, it galvanized people globally to think about these people who were the same people, right? Who were trying to make it to Canada, who were trying to make it to Europe, but who just, you know, a few months prior would have, were seen completely differently. So I do think that, you know, it's not, it's not unidirectional, right? There are these sort of uh, episodes where we see that the system is broken, right? Mm -hmm. That it is highly racialized, mm -hmm. uh, but that also should push us to, to think through opportunities and how we can, we can make it different. Yeah, I think it's also a bit the crisis of coloniality, maybe, uh, because we know colonialism officially is ended, but coloniality is still very pervasive. And now, well, uh, people who were in former colonies are, are coming. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think this disrupts all the hierarchical codes, all the racial codes, all the institutional codes that Europe used to have. These people claim for the same rights, they want uh, a better lifestyle, and we have to use all the possible mechanism to avoid this invasion, this ethnic substitution. So it's interesting how still the media use very colonial words to describe what's happening, showing us how really the colonial language is still very present today. Um, I just want to add, I mean, you know, it's, it's never not about race. Like it's, it's just, there's no place to stand where it's not going to be about race. One of the th lessons I took from the Syrian um, resettlement was the role of sort of political leadership. And I, I don't want to romanticize Canada in the least about this, but the fact is that Syrians were whitened as it were as we saw in the United States, they were further racialized. So at the very moment that they were, there was a whole groundswell of support for a resettlement in Canada, there was a Muslim ban in the United States that affected uh, all sorts of people from the Middle East, including Syrians. And the point here is to just show how calculated, deliberate racialization can be as a way of showing how it can be different and how choices are made by political leaders in this, that, that it's not inevitable um, in the way that it is done. That's not to, sim I'm not trying to simplify it uh, unduly, but just to, to make that um, point. And I guess the other thing to think about with coloniality is a kind of loss of memory that to, I think it's I'm trying to remember who said it, but you know, we are here because you were there, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> this sort of, this uh, idea of having to control the inward movement of people mm -hmm. follows from a history of out external movement from the colonial metropoles mm -hmm. with complete entitlement to those countries that were sub subject to colonization under a very under a regime that romanticized completely open and unrestrained migration. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole long history of, of uh, coloniality that um, plays out here. It feels so sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Um, Go ahead, Anna. I just want to say it, it feels like the door is narrowing. It feels like the barriers are getting higher. Mm -hmm. I mean, we see Canada and the US expanding an agreement under which they turn back asylum seekers at the border. We're seeing a US president who came to office refuting the policies of his predecessor now appearing to adopt versions of them. Mm -hmm. We see European countries trying to foist responsibility for the people arriving on their shores on other countries, any other country. Um, what is going on here? I'm happy to jump in. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, I wrote a, I published a book in 2020 called The Death of Asylum, um, where I developed an argument about the kinds of closing off of paths to asylum that were happening. And the invitation to join the conversation today really made me think about a few years later, whether these arguments hold. And to your point of what is happening right now, I think we're seeing an intensification of something we've been living for decades, which is 
the hardening, the militarization, the fortification of borders, and just incredible investments in keeping people out and expanding enforcement operations and tentacles deep, deep into the countries of origin, regions of origin, the transnational routes that people travel to try to reach sovereign territory where they can make a claim for asylum. And this really, I think, matches geographically what we're talking about discursively in the world so that all of the anti-asylum seeking, anti-immigrant rhetoric, um, the racist and xenophobic rhetoric is correspondingly enacted in the borderlands where states are enacting these very violent bordering policies to keep people out. Yeah, we're thinking also, you know, we were talking about race, but also how class here is heavily involved. And uh, not only the class, people are classified according to how much cultural or economic capital they can bring, and then maybe we can let you in. And so we're thinking that um, the new Italian government, for example, uh, decided to implement deportation centers but uh, if uh, the person um, going there can pay approximately 5,000 euros, they can avoid that. And obviously, if the person would have 5,000 euros to pay for that, probably they wouldn't end up in a detention center. And so how also what Alison was saying, how this is also very productive. Uh, the center for deportation are privatized and they're managed by multi, by, by private organization who clearly capitalized on the arrival, but also try to minimize the cost. Meaning that, uh, and we know this from uh, the experiences that have been recorded of those who can go into the deportation center, we know that uh, food is served with is moldy food, there are cockroaches, mm -hmm. hygiene, health. People who have been in the deportation center haven't seen a doctor in two years, despite they have serious health uh, problems. So this is all highly uh, productive for those managing the so-called crisis. Mm -hmm. And we supposedly have, sorry. Oh, no, no, go ahead. So this, in theory, there's international law that dictates protections for people. Is it broken? Has it always been broken? Are we just ignoring it? So, I sort of take a stab, <laughs> stab at that. <laughs> so, um, you know, many countries have signed the 1951 Refugee Convention and the 1967 Protocol. Um, and yet, the countries that do most of the work in uh, providing um, hosting, if you will, refugees are not signatories. Those are countries, as we talked mm -hmm. about, um, low and middle income countries. Um, the con what's curious, I suppose, is that countries that have signed it invest heavily on evading their legal obligations. And the surprising piece that might, you know, the surprising question that might be, well, why don't you just renounce your adherence to the convention since you clearly don't want to comply with it? And so there's a, a question about why is that? And there's something about, um, I think, fantasies of countries of the global north about themselves as both the inventors and the purveyors and the promoters of human rights, while being, in fact, those who have a profound self-interest in evading the very obligations that they have both created and then undertaken. Mm -hmm. There's a historical trajectory to this that, again, is about race and coloniality. That is, when the 1951 convention came into being, the imagined refugee uh, was a Soviet dissident who was escaping communism. And that served a lot of purposes in the Cold War environment of the time. With the end of the Cold War and the increasing movement of people, racialized people from other countries, from the low and middle income countries, um, the attraction, the political utility of refugee protection declined, diminished for a lot of the countries that had originally signed up to it. And I think that also plays a role in it. It's re I, I underscore this because I think it's important to, to know that states that are party to the convention 
do their utmost through a variety of techniques that are often very violent to avoid their legal or evade their legal obligations. And I, I won't sort of list them all here, but I can't, <laughs> they exist. And to know that, to keep that in mind when one hears the rhetoric of asylum seekers, refugee claimants, uh, migrants who are somehow bogus or abusing the system or otherwise inauthentic, non-genuine. To know that there is a mirror image of that which is states gaming the system. And the reason we don't notice it, I think, is because they're gaming their own system. It's their system and they created it and now they're evading it. But I, I do want, there are many examples of this, but I do want to kind of make that point about what it means to talk about states and their legal obligations to protect refugees. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll add to that and maybe I'll be the sort of uh, the defender of international law here. <laughs> just like, with, but uh, just to say that I think you're absolutely right and I agree entirely with what Audrey is saying that there's all this, this concerted and systematic effort and I actually think it's, it, it comes from the fact that actually increasingly in the 1990s, most of the refugee flows that we're seeing are, are coming actually from racialized contexts, right? So you see since the 1990s, you know, an intensification in Europe in North America uh, of, you know, creating the kind of uh, barriers, both administrative, physical, uh, you know, all of these kinds of, and, and both, you know, Audrey and, and, and Alison have written extensively about all of these in both contexts. But I also think that once states have signed on to these agreements, they hold weight. And, and in ways that are often, uh, you know, both in judicial sense, right? I think we see this in the Canadian context of the of the you know case against the SDCA, and it 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 had you know states do their utmost to try to circumvent their responsibilities, but they it provides us like as advocates, as lawyers, as also just citizens a, a sort of a, a tool of public pressure. And I, I you you may know the case much better, but I just saw that in the news this week that an Italian uh, captain. Uh, the case of an Italian captain who had been returning migrants from the Mediterranean to, to Libya was, uh, I mean, essentially he was found to have been uh, guilty of, of that in, in European courts or was it Italian courts. But, and and, and we, we need to think of these not as, you know, states may try their, their very best, but they still have to try to justify it in the context of their responsibilities to the convention. And in the, the UK case that you mentioned earlier, I think I also was reading this week because of uh, uh, an article by, by a journalist in The Guardian that sort of made me, you know, my, made my eyes pop out because the way that they're framing this new uh, Rwanda policy, the voluntary return, uh, for those who don't know, the UK has been trying for years now to implement a policy whereby people who arrived irregularly would be, would, uh, would be sent to Rwanda as a safe alternative. Uh, and that was fought in the courts. Uh, and now they're trying to do it as a voluntary scheme, quote unquote. But one of the things that struck me in the language of the policy was that it was a voluntary scheme for what they called failed asylum seekers that cannot be returned to their country. <laughs> and I'm like, well, if, they're, if they can't be returned to their country, probably means they had good grounds <laughs> to be asylum seekers in your country. And that, you know, that to me is quite indicative of the ways in which, you know, it, it, these, even though states will try their best to get out of their responsibilities, they have to, you know, and Canada has done this as well, you know, in the, you know we, we think of ourselves as a very generous nation, but thanks to the work of, of scholars like Audrey and, and Alison, we know very well that Canada is as much guilty of this as any other state. You know, Canada used to have a, a safe country, uh, safe third country, what was it called? Safe country of arrival? Safe uh, country of origin. Safe country of origin uh, policy, whereby uh, if asylum seekers who were coming from a list of countries that were very political uh, it had a different asylum process, a, a much more limited, much less grounds for appeal. And, you know, many people were, were deported to these countries. And, but the courts, you know, courts and public pressure worked and that was repealed, right? So there, even though international law is not perfect, it's not, uh, it doesn't hold states to account at all times, it provides us a tool. And I think we should use that. It's interesting because Italy is doing the same with Albania. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so Albania was a former Italian colony. Right. 
and the UK with Rwanda. So we see <laughs> this very ancient uh, connection that are capitalized again, right? So Albania want to enter the EU. There is pressure from Italy to do this favor because Meloni said Albania is like one of us. It should be in the EU because they're like us. Again, so this uh, othering or assimilation of the other. And again, so asking uh, Albania of all countries with whom we have this colonial past that still, even if short, was quite violent. And so it's interesting to see this um, post-colonial connection. Mm -hmm. We're seeing that proliferation of bilateral agreements um, as a way of sort of co almost contracting out, ref you know, refuge obligations. Mm -hmm. um, what are the implications of that? I can jump in here for a minute just to start off the conversation to say that about geopolitical arrangements. And I think increasingly what we're seeing is a very ad hoc set of responses um, to displacement even so that rather than a more rigorous uh, adherence to previously at least respected policies around you know, a robust, a robust processing of refugee claims, for example, um, we're seeing these or, or, or more rigorous forms of um, resettlement or greater investments in resettlement. We're seeing these ad hoc arrangements where often smaller numbers of people might be resettled for highly politicized or geopolitical reasons. Um, so one example that I'm doing research on right now is the people trade between Australia and the United States which was um, made uh, originally um, during the Obama administration, and Trump made a lot of noise about it when he first came into office, and then his administration quietly respected it during the pandemic, where Australia uh, agreed to resettle a very small number of people uh, from the United States in the dozens in exchange for um, the United States uh, resettling up to about a thousand people who had been held in detention facilities on remote islands by Australia, so on Peru and Manus Island. Uh, and it's really um, something, these geopolitical trades are one of those things that's hidden from view from all of the loud discourse about the crisis. They're not made public, we don't know about them, they're not transparent. Um, and so it really poses, I think, very important work for researchers, journalists, uh, advocates to, to find out about these, um, these trades. And this is some of the work that we're trying to do research on and, and, and many scholars are trying to do research on because it's becoming more and more common, whether it's for examples of resettlement of people who've sought asylum, in the example I just gave you, or geopolitical arrangements for people to be returned um, to countries that they have fled. One of the features of these agreements is that they are often informal. Mm -hmm. And that means that one's ability to challenge them legally in court is actually quite limited. And I don't think that that is accidental. Mm -hmm. And what I think that speaks to more broadly is a kind of informality around refugee and migration issues, such that it speaks to the status of migrants as legal subjects, that they are not those who can bring, who, whose attempts to be visible and legible to authority, to account, you know, state accountability is diminished by being subject encapsulated in these highly informal agreements that are often discretionary, the terms aren't public. And I'm really glad that Alison's doing this research on the Australia-US deal because I tried to find out about that years ago and had a great deal of difficulty actually getting to the bottom of it. Um, and I, you know, not to sound too polemical, but hopefully just polemical enough <laughs> about it, you know, these agreements, whether it's the Rwanda agreement, the Albania one, or something I've been doing research on, which is agreements in effect to encourage um, states to prohibit the exit of people who, the, who, they, who European states fear will try to make their way to Europe is a kind of weird use of states as migration penal colonies. Mm -hmm. Places that um, states, typically European states or North American states or whatever, they want these other states to confine them for, if you will, um, the crime of 
attempting to migrate while unwanted. And to start thinking about the ways in which those colonial connections and others are being used to construct these kind of migrant penal colonies. Mm -hmm. And to think of the, it sounds weird, but from the gaze of those who are pushing these agreements, um, there is, I think, a little bit of that dynamic going on. Mm -hmm. I'd love to add to that. That's very interesting. I'd like, I really like that framing because I've been, I, I think about this a lot in the context of the ways in which uh, particularly uh, European states, but also uh, it's true in other contexts, but in the Middle East, uh, European states in particular, uh, use foreign aid in the Middle East as a as sort of a way to um, sometimes very explicitly tie it to questions of maintaining refugee populations or even citizen populations away from European shores. But it's often it's one of the the sort of facts or kind of fun fun puzzles I I, I bring up to my students all the time is that you know Lebanon is a country that probably most people know as a country that has a major financial crisis, you know, deeply indebted, has huge, and yet it has, it has had a biometric passport for longer than Canada has, you know, and that's not a coincidence, right? That's EU funding that has been dedicated to enforcing not just its own borders, but Lebanese borders, right? And making sure that they can trace those borders and that they can, you know, have those borders be as strong as possible. And in, in ways that, you know, aim to do exactly what Audrey said. So some, I think one of the things to think about also is that a state's migration policy is actually much broader than just the ways in which it governs its own borders, right? It's about all kinds of ways, all these kinds of arrangements that it makes with other states. And it's increasingly, I think, moving us away from, again, as I said in my opener, you know, this sense that we have global systems and global institutions to address global problems, but now it's these ad hoc mm -hmm. state to state mm -hmm. relations. Mm -hmm. So what are the human implications of that? Powerful. <laughs> yeah. well, Go ahead. Just that and people who are displaced are carrying the burden of, of what's happening here. Um, and so back to your point, Audrey, about how do we get information about something like the Australia-US deal or the UK-Rwanda deal? Um, I mean, one of the things that we're doing with that research is oral histories um, with people who have been displaced, who have fled, who have taken these incredible journeys that often last years and cross many national contexts and borders and involve periods of imprisonment and limbo in many different places, um, only to one day find themselves traded across the globe to another place, another place, a country that may well have contributed to their initial displacement in conflict from home. And so how I'm, I'm very interested to learn how people make sense of their own displacement and these geo geopolitical relationships, because it's those stories um, that are often, and, and political perspectives that are often missing from the very public discourses that we're often subjected to about migration and borders uh, and exclusion. So I think you know the, the human cost is is so clearly so clearly documented in so many ways in artistic representations emerging from migration journeys and deaths at sea in the multi-generational or intergenerational lived experiences of displacement and imprisonment. So we have to always attend to not only what's happening, what's happened in the past, how it's being lived in the present and, and how, what will be the ramifications of these policies be for, for generations to come. I think this is a very important point, actually, how the oral testimonies are counter narratives that we are using to counterbalance this mainstream dominant narrative that we have about migration, about the other, and how this location, they're not just geographical spaces, but also symbolic spaces, and they are reservoirs in a way of stories that I think we have 
in a way to collect and to excavate because they are there. So we need to create platform for these stories to be heard because they also provide us with a lot of data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so this, this is crucial. So how can we, what kind of data and theories we can find from these stories and how they help to counterbalance this imbalance power. So I think is a essential point the oral testimonies. Maybe one of just to, to build on what um, Angelica and, and Alison um, have been saying, I think these are exercises in rehumanization in the face of the dehumanization, which is the human impact. And that dehumanization it resides in you know what Alison has talked about, and we all know the violence, the death, the death that doesn't count, mm -hmm. the the passive use of people drowned, mm -hmm. right, as opposed to you know, what actually has happened that has caused them to drown, mm -hmm. right? And the responsibility and the accountability and the action and the deliberate inaction. So there's, there's a whole dehumanization that goes on at the discursive level, whether it is discrediting um, people who, who migrate, who flee, um, the dehumanization of actively allowing people to die and somehow distancing oneself from accountability for causing preventable death through the language of jurisdiction, for example, which does a lot of work in these contexts. Um, you know, there's a quote that I, a line in um, Hannah Arendt where she talks about how um, Germany was quite happy for a bedraggled kind of um, poor, victimized, persecuted, um, Jews fleeing Europe to, to, stand, to flee to other countries and recount what had happened to them because her, what she, her point, the point she made was people will see these miserable looking people and they won't think, oh my God, what has, what has, been, what has Germany done to them? But they'll think, what did they do to deserve this, right? And, and that they will be seen as somehow their very abject nature will be held against them as if they must be, they must have done something. And I think the, in, the treating of migrants as disposable human beings and the extent to which the, their survival is so, um, th their lives are not grievable, their survival is happenstance. Instead of understanding that as criminal, mm -hmm. there is a way of saying, well, they must somehow be undeserving. <laughs> and, and so the, just to turn it back to the, these histories and these narratives, these single voices that attach these, you know, make, put voices into the people to reclaim their humanity is really vital mm -hmm. to what is otherwise, I think, a real onslaught of dehumanization. Yeah, I think this is so important. And I think one of the ways in which we see this manifesting even sort of empirically when we see these mm -hmm. patterns is that this, you know, we hear a lot about this, you know, the, are they really refugees or are they migrants? And, you know, why are they all men? And why are they all? And one of the things that isn't, you know, that is made invisible is, you know, all of these policies that have made getting to the shores of Europe or getting to Canadian soil or getting to the US so more, you know, so much more difficult and so much more risky and leading to so much more violence and death and that the ways in which this in and of itself shapes migration patterns right and makes you know and and there's a, a new book by rowan arar and david fitzgerald that you know talks about sort of the sociology of of refugee displacement that i highly recommend and one of the things that's really central to the to this book is the idea that actually you know and and we know this right we know this from personal experiences from oral histories from our own is that you know, most uh, migrants and refugees make decisions not just as individuals, but as households, right? And they make them in collectives. And it may be the case that, you know, when a family may choose to send uh, the healthiest, strongest male, you know, first to try to get the whole family out, right? And that these patterns that are, you know, that are given to us either through media narratives or through political narratives as if they are just a given, right? They're, they're, they're actually produced, right? The, 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 the conditions of asylum and of accessing protection shape 
who actually takes these trajectories mm -hmm. and the risks that they have to take and that they may be themselves, you know, uh, ha you know, they have families back home that they're trying to get out. And that. so I think it's, it's important to think about how these things feed each other. Mm -hmm. We have the immense privilege of having two women here today who have been through Canada's asylum system. Um, so we're going to take a moment. We're going to you're going to get a break from us. Um, and I'm happy to welcome up Samia and Anit. So I think you're going to sit. Yeah. Um, Samia Hossein, originally from Bangladesh, has called Canada home with, along with her daughter for the past eight years. In 2015, while she was expecting her daughter, Bangladesh was experiencing political unrest. Writers and editors were being killed for advocating secularism. As part of this, her family received death threats from fundamentalists. Coincidentally, there was a conference in Winnipeg, so she decided to jump on a plane, leaving everything behind. A month after her arrival, her beautiful baby girl was born, healthy and safe. In her spare time, Samia loves writing and performing short stories. She also enjoys reading when she's not binge watching Netflix. She graduated in architecture from Bangladesh University in, of Engineering and Technology, and now works as a product solutions designer for a furniture manufacturing company. Dr. Umut Uzunel, a renowned ophthalmologist, has dedicated herself to providing free eye care to underserved people in Somalia, Senegal, Uganda, Kenya, and Mali. Despite personal challenges, including a muscular disease causing weakness, she has conducted over 20,000 examinations and 3,000 surgeries, often saving patients' vision. In 2023, she received the Women of Distinction Award from the YWCA for her volunteer efforts. Having fled Turkey due to government objections to her nonprofit involvement, Dr. Uzunel found refuge in Canada. Her name, Umut, means hope in Turkish. So I'd like to welcome up for Samia and then Umut. Thank you very much for inviting us here. And it's been an honor to present my story in front of all of you guys. Um, it is indeed a privilege. I am um, one of those uh, people who claim asylum after entering Canada. I am only one node in this data uh, that we have in statistics. But this is my story that why and how I came here. It was a sunny August day in 2015. Dhaka traffic was the craziest on Gulshan Avenue at 5 p.m. The whole day, I was in turmoil about whether I'd get the visa or not. If I got it, I'd be traveling halfway across the world. Mom called. Did you get it? Yes, Ma. On the other end of the phone, there was a silence. She was relieved and she was sad. My flight was scheduled for 2 a.m. I wasn't really thinking about anything except my sandals. They were killing my swollen pregnant feet. I had stopped at the market on the way home to buy a new pair. Near the gate, a man was sitting on the carb, selling a bunch of colorful sandals displayed around him. I picked out a pair was light blue plastic flip-flops with white polka dots and a huge baby pink flower on the top. It took me a year to notice that there were glitter on the petals. The shoes looked like they were for kids. They were comfortable. Everyone in the family was waiting. Mom was cooking my favorite dinner. My brother and sister were packing my bags. My nephew and niece wanted to play with me. They didn't understand that I was leaving. I tried to tell them, but they giggle and run away. It was nearly midnight when we reached the airport. I barely realized I was leaving my whole family 
my whole support system, my friends, and my brainchild, my business that I built. I wish the people tearing everything apart knew what it was like to be in my shoes. The plane started to take off. I switched off my phone, leaned back, and began thinking. Almost six months ago, our lives turned upside down. And not because of the baby I had just learned was coming. The party we had planned for the announcement of my pregnancy never took place. Because one of my friends who was coming was hacked to death the night before. Another was stabbed many times and one of her fingers was chopped off. Their fault was writing books and blogs and just being secular. One month later, another person was killed, then another one. They were targeted by Islamic extremists because of their lack of belief in religion. After the third killing, one of my family members got a death threat for writing a book in atheism. And in extension, so did my unborn child and me. Secular publishers and writers were getting multiple death threats. And the publisher of this book later got hacked to death. The co-author and the editor were already slaughtered or stabbed to death. I kept changing our addresses, commuting routes, and phone numbers, but the situation kept getting worse. Between 2013 and 2016, 48 peoples were killed by Islamic fundamentalists. And all their faults were their lack of belief in Islam, writing blogs on evolution, opening a music school, or being gay. Fundamentalists want to bring the whole country under Islamic law. I wish they could agree that one size doesn't fit all. Just a year ago, we were organizing workshops, writing books and blogs and criticizing social taboos. And now we are running for our lives. Luckily, I got into a conference I plan to apply for asylum upon entry. When I say goodbye uh, to my family at the airport, we didn't know when we'd meet again. Turned out it would take seven years for my mom to see her grandkid for the first time. I entered Canada exhausted after 19 year, hours of traveling. My $2 plastic sandals had brought me 7,000 miles away. This could have been the most delightful day. But while I was in the plane, Neil, another person I knew, had just been killed. His visa was rejected by a European embassy and somehow the information got leaked that he was trying to leave the country. Six weeks later, I wore this pair of sandals to the delivery room at St. Joseph's Hospital in Toronto. I was scared with no family around, but it was not so long before my Canadian Bangladeshi baby girl, Sophie, she was lying beside me, reminding me of the value of life. We are so lucky to be alive. And that was my sto story. Thank you very much. Um, it was a privilege indeed to hear all of you. And now I'd like to uh, ask Kumu to come here and tell the, her story. My position is good. Hello. So it's kind of very exciting moment for me. So uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, it, I'm honored to be here. Um, I wanna uh, perform my uh, uh, story here. This is uh, it was written um, during the the shoe project workshops. Uh, therefore, we connected our stories to the shoes, specific shoes, uh, during those uh, projects. 
uh, but I am here today uh, as a member of Spacious uh, Art Collective uh, here. This is kind of new uh, organization uh, for the immigrant and refugee women sport. So, okay, uh, my story name is uh, Time to Grieve. On a cold day in the winter of 2017, I landed in Toronto and told the border officer I wanted to become a refugee, even though I didn't know what being a refugee meant. I was stateless, alone and desperate. I was arriving from Turkey because due to the political unrest, there was a potential for me to be arrested for the volunteer work I had been doing in Africa. My husband was already in jail. I was skeptical about how to survive in this cold and snowy country as a disabled person who is unable to walk even on pavement that is not icy. But I had to, I had to pri prioritize. My first need was to have a country to live in. During the immigration process, my feeling were, feelings were frozen. I couldn't feel any sorrow for what I had lost or left behind, including my kids, jailed husband, family, identity, and possessions. I didn't know where to fit in. I felt like the boots that I bought in the first uh, winter here despite the fact that I never liked boots. They are tough to get on and take off given the weakness of my feet. They increase my pain. I felt more alone than before because I noticed my disease was getting worse. Perhaps you wonder who I am. I am an ophthalmologist who is passionate about helping people without access to eye treatments including surgeries. This was the volunteer work I was doing in Africa. In specific operations I was performing, the outcome is very fast. So I did not have to be patient while waiting for the good results. That is like my personality. I was really impatient until coming to Canada. The immigration process contributed to my patient's education <laughs> as there is no rush in this part of the world for paperwork. What was making my life unbearable was not being allowed to bring my kids to Canada. Today, I am practicing naturopathic medicine here. It does not work as quickly as surgery. Now I need time to see the outcomes of my recommendations. This process continues to teach me how to be patient in all aspects of life. The moment I reunited with my kids in Germany was incredible. It was 18 months after I had left them in Turkey when they were 15 and eight years old. When I saw them, I felt like I had everything. After a few weeks, my young daughter told me how much both she and I had changed while we were apart. Yes, she was right. I was different. I had met a lot of losers and obstacles, and she had too. She was bigger now, and I had missed her school plays, graduation parties, sick days, and birthday parties. So I understood it was time to grieve, but I had many more things to do before grieving. That's why I postponed my grief again until we settled in Canada and they started school. Then, it was time to reveal feelings that, ha that had been waiting under the mat for years. I did it at the school in the front of my classmates as a democ 
in case. The professor was looking for a volunteer to demonstrate intake procedures. Only I raised my hand. So I became a patient for the purpose of my classmates learning. The professor asked many detailed questions that were necessary in order to choose the right homeopathic remedy. Someone was hearing my feelings. I hadn't shared it in this way before. And I started to cry while trying to look strong. It was a big relief for me. I cried almost every day for a few weeks. Then it was gone. I healed myself as we are taught in naturopathic medicine and as we teach others to heal themselves. I noticed that if someone is trying to be strong, it may mean there are a lot of things to express, a lot of sup suppressed emotions. So let's grieve and be relieved. Thank you. Oh, really? <laughs> She's also crying. <laughs> okay. So, okay. Thank you both so much. <clears throat> so I'm going to stay up for a bit. Yeah, hang on. We got another chair. Okay. I can come back or... Okay. The, my position is good or I can... Maybe I can go. Because I don't want to... Oh, maybe that's, that's good. It. Sure. It's good, right? Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you both so, so much. Um, I wanted to ask, and Umut, you spoke to this a little bit. You said the Canadian immigration system taught you patience. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Can you elaborate patience. on that a bit? Yes. Yeah. It, uh, it takes a lot of time, actually, for my... Uh, re to reunite my uh, kids, actually, I did a lot of uh, effort. Uh, um, a journalist, journalist published our uh, story uh, on the Toronto, in Toronto Star. Then uh, the Canada Immigration Service sent us an email, and then I hopefully uh, brought my daughters here after that, after this uh, publication. Otherwise, uh, I believe it will take a few more years in my opinion wow. <laughs> a lot of people don't know that canada doesn't have visas for refugees yeah. if you want to claim asylum here you have to come some other way yes um yeah. so like in samuel's case you had to come to a conference and then claim asylum at the airport is that right yes what was that like i was skeptical that i could uh enter canada but well, it, it is cliche, but people are really nice here. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I had all the uh, necessary papers with me. So for me, the processes were kind of smooth. And we had um, reasons, we had paper cuttings and um, all those papers that you need to a claim for asylum in our case our file was this thick wow. all papers printed um but there was this uncertainty it must have been scary it was and um i didn't have any um anything and as i say that my girl was born here i didn't have um health card then but i really pay respect to the system, um, I know that we, in a lot of times, we we have people who um, are the victims of the system. Mm -hmm. But I would um, rather present me as a, a fortunate receiver of of the receiving end of the system, that I I was able to um, receive healthcare. And I was able to um, build a life here. 
of course there was was these moments of grief and these moments of uncertainty it was very scary um in the way when we were settling down my family broke apart mm. there were a lot of other things uh and in with those other things i would still um say i'm really happy that i'm here and i am really happy that i'm alive my girl is alive and i wouldn't probably would have understand how um privileged i am um before coming to this uh, before going through this journey we're, we're very lucky to have you here thank you it's my privilege too thank you are there things about the system that either of you would change yes obviously uh of course um i would not talk about the system before applying uh, before claiming uh, asylum but after claiming asylum there are some um some nodes on the journey that we can change um information overwhelm um then to settle down um there you need a support system mm. and although canadian government has set up a lot of um agencies or a lot of um uh, secondary help to back you up i don't think that is um enough or i don't think that is really helping the system it's like um your house is falling down and i'm just um trying to put a bamboo instead of the column in one corner um maybe if just maybe like i um try to find where are the pain points that i can help with but maybe um if the users themselves can um in this case the refugees themselves can be um allowed to point out the pain points and work on that i think it would be the output would be rather effective what kind of pain points um for me settlement mm -hmm. housing issues child care issues there there was a big time um i personally suffer suffered from um, depression of course ptsd of course it's it comes with being a refugee that you are gonna have to um face these things so and it has also um came out in the discussion that you cannot predict these problems so yeah these are the pain points mm -hmm, mm -hmm. very unpredictable unpredictable and very uncertain thanks actually the old case uh, in my opinion uh, unique so that's why we cannot follow the same um, steps in each case it is it's okay i am okay with that but the problem is there is no one we can contact if we have any issues during this process there is um uh, for example in my case i couldn't find anyone uh, to help me because i went to the germany to see my uh, kids and my plan uh, was to bring them to here uh, and i um hired a, a lawyer there and then uh, i did everything i can, i could do but no one is the, uh, the I, i couldn't find anyone to contact to speak to explain myself mm -hmm. um but then i i choose to, to uh, publish my story on the uh, yeah, journal or uh, online platform so uh, it was really effective actually i i, I didn't like it i don't, it shouldn't be like that because every everyone uh, cannot be lucky like me I have uh, many friends. I know their stories as well. So the the biggest uh, challenge challenge for me uh, was to bring my kids. I, for example, the actually it is continue now because my husband is still in Turkey and I'm trying to bring her, uh, him 
here as well. But the process so strange, so uh, hard. There is no um, steps, clear steps. We can go. Uh, everything is like unclear, unpredictable. I don't. I don't know when he can come here. I don't know. And I think the authorities uh, don't know as well. <laughs> <laughs> because we are asking this to, to the lawyer, uh, through the lawyer, we, no one knows. Yeah. Thank you both so, so much. Um, I think I'm going to get our panelists to come back and then we'll have questions at the end. Yeah. Okay. But thank you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. <laughs>
yet my brother and his kids remain and cannot become, you know, we've tried many ways to get them to this country and we cannot. Mm -hmm. And there's something quite, you know, to ask people to, to, to sort of leave all of these ties as if, um, you know, that, that is, I think that is profoundly um, inhumane, but also dehumanizing, mm -hmm. you know, it, it strips us of, of those social connections. So I think it's, it's, yeah, in both your stories that really resonated with me. So I, I agree with the point about bureaucracy and, and just as evidence of, of what you were explaining about getting a visa to Canada. And I mentioned earlier about all the ways we try to avoid our responsibilities. Had you said, I would like a visa to come to Canada because I'm a refugee, you would not have gotten that visa. Of course. And so what does it mean if in order to get the protection that we promise by signing, we voluntarily promise to provide by signing the refugee convention, we erect all of these obstacles to you actually being able to do it. So that's one of the things that I think about in terms of, of that game we play of, yes, you, we promise we'll provide refugee protection, but if you act, but if you come from a country that requires a visa and we impose a visa requirement on every country that we think has refugees who might seek to come to Canada, what, what does that mean about the system? I guess the, the other, one of the other things, you know, when you were talking about the, the challenges of bringing family here, I, I also think about two things. One I think about is the ways in which we create categories of people as if this is what defines them. As if to say you're a refugee doesn't also mean you're a, a, a spouse, a, a parent, uh, all of these things, and that your life to be accepted as a refugee must mean to be accepted as a whole human being, which means something about being a parent, being an ophthalmologist, being a writer, being all of these things that somehow get carved away as if you are only this one thing, which you obviously, nobody is. Um, and I guess the last thing I really, um, <laughs> when I call, you know, I've noticed this, when you deal with immigration, you never get the name of the person you're dealing with. Yeah, right? There's that's never that's a name, amazing. nobody will ever <laughs> identify them, ever. Never, it's, ever. I call, you know, I have a tax problem. I call Canada Revenue, Revenue Agency. The first thing they do is tell me their name mm -hmm. and, their number. and their number. So what does that say about the respect that we have for different groups of people, right? About the relationship that they have to the state. And I just want to say one other thing, I guess, is that I really appreciate you talking about the need to grieve. Mm -hmm. um, because I think, and it's hard and I, I don't, you know, I, but I appreciate it because I think we don't talk about it enough. And I, I know that you said you felt, you know, it's privilege and all that, and, and we constantly expect it. And a lot of people do feel grateful and glad to be here, but that shouldn't hide how much pain um, has also can accompany this. And so I just was really appreciative of you talking about the importance of grieving. I can say that many people um, cannot grieve during the process because they try to survive. So they don't have time to grieve. Actually, I, 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 I want to mention the story that as well. So there are many things before grieving. So you should put, put that grieving to the side and you should continue to survive, uh, bring your family or all things you, you lost. So there are a lot of things. That's why we always um, postpone our uh, feelings during mm. those process. Then uh, it comes out, so it causes a lot of depression and mental issues. Yeah. It increases definitely. Uh, there, I am a um, naturopath now, registered naturopath in Ontario, Alberta, and Nova Scotia. So I'm seeing a lot of mental health issues, uh, and uh, yeah. Um, some of them uh, listed to the, this immigration and uh, refugee process as well. Uh, so they are trying to postpone and uh, they are trying to ignore those feelings until the, something uh, goes well and then they focus that up, but, but it's kind of late, late to work on that. Just one sec, sorry. For next time. Um, one thing I wanted to ask, actually one thing I wanted to bring up that, to Audrey's point, um, 
the vast majority of access to information requests that go to Immigration Canada are from applicants, not from journalists, not from muckrakers, but from people trying to find out what is going on with their claim. So that should tell you something about the Canadian immigration process. Um, but I wanted to ask you, given where we're at right now, given what we've been discussing, what do you see happening next? Talking about unpredictability, I mean, uh, considering what's happening in this specific moment when we are speaking, what's happening in the world, I am a kind of loss of words because I, I cannot physically imagine what can happen. Uh, this is how I feel now. I mean, such a, I feel sometimes everything is surreal and I feel maybe it's me not being well because what I see around me. So we have reached such a degree of dehumanization and violence. And when you think that you have reached the bottom, there is a new level. So in a way, I don't want to imagine what is going to happen next because it's going to be even more horrific than what we are witnessing now. So this is how I can answer to your question. Lack of words, lack of imagination. I mean, I, I think I, I very much concur with Angelica. I think, you know, the we there's not a lot of room for hope in this mm. particular moment. But I do, you know, I think if rather than uh, and this is the political scientist in me, like I'm trying to think about, you know, what are the sort of patterns I see rather than sort of, and they're not they're not great from a protection standpoint. But I do think that, uh, you know, because it, a lot of what Audrey was mentioning earlier, but we are seeing more and more of sort of these proliferation of ad hoc arrangements. And we're seeing it right now with the, the crisis in Gaza as well, right? We've seen the Canadian government decide to respond in an ad hoc manner through a specialized program that, as far as I could tell, I, you know, my latest reading this week, zero Gazans have, have made it to Canada. And, and again, this is a program that is designed for very, you know, and has different rules and different, uh, you know, if you want to find out exactly what the process is, it's different than the Ukrainian one, it's different than the, the Afghan one, and it's different. Than, so, um, and, and I, that's where sort of my prediction lies, is that we're going to see more and more states try to preempt uh, claims of uh, asylum seekers and refugees under established rights through the use of specialized ad hoc kind of programs like this. And what it does, I think, to, to Audrey's point is that it makes it, you know, harder to fight against in the courts because there's not an established body of law that speaks to this particular, but also it makes it, you know, for applicants, you know, I was reading reporting on families of, uh, of Gazans who are trying to get their families out. And, you know, even those who were able to meet the incredibly onerous requirements in a context of ongoing violence and war have no response mm -hmm. as to what's happening to their families. And so, you know, th that's that's sadly where I see these things going. But I, the flip side, and I think, Umut, you know, your, your, your personal story speaks to this, is that I think that these the law might not be our biggest advocate in this place, but public pressure is. And, you know, journalists and, and, and advocates and because we, you know, that's the only way these programs get in the limelight, right, and get made visible rather than inv invisible, as governments often want them to be. Yeah, so, so I'm not an optimist by nature, <laughs> and I, but I feel like I can't real. I don't want to add to, you know, I sort of add to more negativity, uh, mostly because I agree with what I what has been said. So let me try to say something that's not, <laughs> yeah. So I'm, it doesn't mean you stop fighting. And the, there are, I, there are always stories of individuals like you. And there's always work to be done. And there are small, maybe individualized victories and you sort of have to keep fighting them. Um, you know, when you talked about getting you know, right before your daughter was born and healthcare, 
just a few years before, the Canadian government had actually tried to restrict access to health care for refugee claimants, and mm -hmm. we fought it really hard, and we won. Mm -hmm. um, now, these are rear guard actions, right? These aren't making the world better. Typically, they're stopping something from getting even worse. But you got to do it. And the other thing I would say is that for all the cruelty that we see in the current system it, with respect to refugees, um, human movement is unstoppable. And that is true. And it will continue. And, and as much as, you know, and in some ways, you can see the level of cruelty as a, also a sign of desperation of a system that actually is kind of built on this fantasy that you can um, micromanage the movement of humanity in a way that uh, sovereignty or versions of sovereignty that we're most familiar with now demand, but you can't. It, it can't be controlled in that way. What would better look like? <laughs> well, it might be very European. Better would look like without any passport, people moving. Um, somehow there would be a filter where um, where we can um, assure the security of citizens in the planet, citizens of the planet. That would be better. Better would be um, in smaller communities, people standing up for each other. Better would be in in judiciary systems, people fighting for the right. In academia, people fighting for the right and better would be if we stop assuming the the racial um, if we stop pre uh, assuming that racial privileges and um, okay re um, what's the opposite of privilege Disadvantage. Yeah, disadvantage. To stop, assume that res uh, racial privileges and um, disadvantages are a given. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that would be better for me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for me, uh, if the public awareness of like any kind of discrimination, so. I am against any kind of discrimination in the world, actually. So because during my registration process in uh, naturopathic medicine, I faced uh, dis disability discrimination as well in Canada. This is so strange. I didn't expect that as well. So yeah, uh, in the during this process as well, the, I uh, don't want anyone to face any any kind of discrimination. This this would be better for me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'll, I'll try something. <laughs> no, I, I think a better world would be a world where more people can move and fewer people feel they need to. And maybe that's that's the world I aspire to. Write that down. That's the, the power of stories. I think stories are so important. Voices, bodies, transgressing spaces. So, yeah, thank you for sharing your words because words are important. Words are important. That's why we are here in, at the university, right? Because we believe in the power of words. So um, I think, yes, thank you. I, I, I feel totally uh, uh, at a loss for words after that. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, to to uh, reiterate, I think, in, in other ways what Audrey said, I think, you know, so many of us come to this space wanting to provide, you know, wanting for the people who so desperately need to flee their countries or to leave their contexts to be given safe access and, and protection. 
But ultimately, the you know, and to come back to coloniality and the conversations around colonialism earlier, I mean, the thing that one hopes the most is that people do not have to face contexts where they have to flee their homes, right? This is something that I think we, because of this impetus to focus on, on how people are grateful, as you mentioned, Audrey, earlier, you know, we, we lose sight of it, that, the, you know, this is a very, very difficult uh, choice that people are making. And, and yes, people who want to move should be allowed the freedom to move, but that we should also be, you know, that asylum protection, and this is something that I, I really care about a lot, I think should come hand in hand with caring about broader human rights and broader conditions of people's lives globally. And, and, and not in the way that some states want to, you know, uh, talk about root causes and, and push away refugees and asylum seekers by giving away aid to, but really into thinking, you know, uh, holistically about what it means to think about addressing global problems and, and while still providing kind of freedom of movement. Are we looking at the end of asylum? Is Allison still here? Yes. So Allison has to go, unfortunately. <laughs> well, we she can say no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Allison has the answer. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't think so. I mean, I, I, it's, it's not a popular view, I think, among refugee and asylum scholars. I think a lot of people, rightly, are very frustrated and, you know, are jaded with the system, right, into the frustrations of how difficult and how much more narrowing it's, it's had. But I... I I do think it still has uh, weight, and I think you know, you know, kind of as you were saying, um, Audrey, about the you know the ways in which all of this crisis talk is about also acknowledging kind of a weakness of the state and controlling movement. I think similarly, all of the ways in which states are trying all of these myriad ways to find ways to not, you know, um, fulfill their obligations, also speaks to the fact that they still feel like they have to do that. You know, and I think we we have, you know, t imagining that we don't have asylum is, is such a worse <laughs> situation than one we find ourselves in, even though this one is terrible, that I, I hold hope in advocating for continuing to maintain asylum and to see the, the space for continuing to do that. <laughs> well said. <laughs> um. So I wanted to open it up to questions. If anyone in the audience has a question for any of these brilliant people. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm wondering if you are aware of any other country or any other system that does treat asylum seekers or have a system for asylum seekers, which is better than Canada or which can be a role model for us to follow. So anyway. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad you asked that. And, and in some ways, you know, I've been involved, for example, in litigation challenging different aspects of the Canadian system. And so the best answer I can give you is that it depends what feature of the system you're talking about. So for example, um, the Canadian system uh, will look at, um, you can possibly lose your refugee protection um, years after you have it um, because you've returned to your country of origin, let's say. Other, you know, that's pretty harsh um, compared to what other countries do. On the other hand, Canada no longer applies a safe country of origin principle that other countries do. So I'm maybe this is really revealing my kind of general disposition, but I don't think there are a lot of heroes in this story. Um, and there are countries that do better with some things and worse with others. And I'm in favor of cherry picking the best that's out there.
Hi there. Uh, my name is Noah Khan. I'm a junior fellow here at Massey College. Um, and my question, because uh, throughout the discussion, it seemed like we were talking at the level of government providing asylum. And I'm wondering about the role of other organizations in providing asylum. So I know at Massey College, we have the Scholars at Risk program, and there's various kind of initiatives across universities broadly. Um, I'm not sure about other organizations, but the academy is, is where I'm located. And so I'm wondering whether initiatives like that kind of take... Um, the onus off the government or whether there's a kind of downloading of responsibility to other organizations or what that type of relationship is like from, you know, kind of the governmental level to, you know, various organizations. Both of us have to work in that. <laughs> yeah, Go ahead. Uh, I'm happy to take that. I mean, I think, uh, I think there's a real danger of that. And, and so Canada, you know, to, to what Audrey was saying earlier to, to Senator Zeba's uh, question is, you know, I think Canada, one of the things that it's very, very famous for globally is that is the private sponsorship model, for example, right? So Canada is a pioneer in that. In that, It's it's now become a model that Canada is actually starting to export globally, right? Mm -hmm. And that other countries are starting to model after. The danger, you know, it's a wonderful program. You know, it's a program that I think as Canadians we should be proud of. And I think it's a, you know, it's a, it's a program that I've, you know, volunteered and, and contributed to, to sponsorship groups and but, but the Canadian program was built in part, in large part, because of public pressure and public advocacy. And I think that part of the story is lost. And at particular moments in time, and, and here you know, I'm drawing some, some of Audrey's work and, and Shauna Labman's work on this as well, we've, we see the Canadian government of a particular moment sort of retreating back uh, on their own commitments to resettlement and saying, well, we have this private sponsorship model, and if people don't want to sponsor, that's kind of on them. And there, are, you know, so that's the danger of some of these, uh, because they allow the state, if it wants, to sort of put it onto people, right, and public pressure. And one of my worries with the sort of uh, exporting of this model elsewhere is that in Canada, we actually have a very strong public uh, constituency uh, that helped develop this model, and that is constantly vigilant to the government's ability to do this and puts the pressure. You know, Germany or the UK or right, may, because it didn't, doesn't have that same history, may not have that same sort of vigilance to the dangers of that. Now the Scholars at Risk program, I think is, is a little bit different because these are sort of very, um, you know, I do think all of these, uh, they, have, they, have, they, sh they have space and they should be promoted. And I think it's good that citizens and public communities and private businesses and universities get involved because I think it also changes the sort of public discourse around asylum and refugees more broadly, but they shouldn't be substitutes for commitments that are, you know, that states can be held accountable to because, you know, who do you hold accountable for that? I'll just add one word to what Lama said, which was, which was uh, wonderful, but to say also, in addition to the risk that the, private commitment to resettle um, might be used to diminish the public commitment to resettle. I think you, you were getting at this, but I want to just say there's also a risk that resettlement will be pitted against asylum. And so since we're here talking about asylum, I think it's really important to um, be aware of that. And that's a particular concern with the kind of export of resettlement to countries that don't have any um, existing practice of resettlement and are looking for ways to evade their responsibilities with respect to asylum seekers. And to put it in the most stark terms, and I'll overstate it a little bit just to make it clear, there is out there available a kind of discourse that says, ooh, resettled refugees are the good refugees because they are languishing in refugee camps and we get to choose them. The ones who come on their own initiative, even if they are the same people, well, anyway, the ones who come on their own initiative as asylum seekers, they're the bad ones, they're bogus, they're all of fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. The risk here is that states can say, oh, we're happy to commit to resettlement as yet another basis upon which to diminish their responsibilities with respect to asylum. And to go back to what we were talking about a bit earlier, resettlement is entirely discretionary. States have no legal obligation to do it at all. 
asylum is underpinned by a legal obligation under the Refugee Convention. And even as I was critical of states <laughs> evading it, I want to side here with Lama and say it is a legal obligation. And so the risk of substituting what is discretionary, unenforceable, and entirely ad hoc for something that is an, in fact, legal obligation the states have undertaken to perform is also a risk. It doesn't have to materialize, but it's a risk to be aware of, I think. Hi, I'm Ami Bonsu. I'm an assistant professor at York University. I want to make a quick comment, which is to thank you guys for putting this event on, because recently I've been listening to the news and going back to the importance of journalism. Some of the people were talking on this panel, and at one point they were like, can we stop the asylum seekers from coming? <laughs> right, a journalist. And then another journalist had to say what you had said, Audrey, and say that, no, we have this obligation. So even at that journalism level, some journalists are asking questions that are very scary and problematic. Um, so my question is, is for you. Uh, about 20 years ago, you wrote about the discursive disappearance of refugees. Can I ask you to make an assessment now where we're at with this? Has it gotten any better because of the Ukrainian refugees? Has that been a pro to bring that? No. I don't think so. So, but did I mention that I'm not much of an optimist? Really? <laughs> um, so just to say, the discursive disappearance of the refugees. So what I was trying to say is that as we incorporate language into our discourse that discredits refugees, oh, they're, they're bogus, they're frauds, they're economic migrants, they're all of those things. As that enters our language, that is making them disappear from the way we talk about those people who come, that makes it easier, that enables us or states, governments, to adopt laws that actually make them disappear. Actually make them disappear through in, and I think what I was writing about 20 years ago was a safe third country agreement. Once you've got a narrative that says they're all fraudsters, uh, think about um, Mexicans right now, right? As an example of how this has been used. Once, you've once you have asserted, established, if you will, that they're not genuine, well, that just opens the channel to enacting a law that will physically prevent them from actually being here. So we see that with, of course, the recent changes to the Safe Third Country Agreement, which now, in theory, not in theory, in law, is extended across the entire Canada-US border, which is a kind of fantastical um, construct that you know can't actually be operationalized, but it serves a particular purpose in discourse and in our in the political imagination, um, which a lot more can be said about it. But I'll I'll, mm -hmm. and I'll stop there. But but it also has you know human costs. Yeah. As yes. We discussed oh, earlier, yeah. which is you know, yes. Yeah, it makes it a lot. You know, pe because I think it's within fifteen days, right? You have to, yeah. 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 So you know, now people who are trying to cross are trying as the best they can to not to be seen. Yeah. For, right. You know. So, yeah, exactly. yeah. Yeah. so we now have a law that says you, in theory, cannot cross from the United States into Canada to make a refugee claim anywhere across the Canada-US border, um, and um, at least for 15 days. Right? So, so the idea is that if you can somehow hide out for 15 days, then you can make a claim. Right? Yeah. Now, why is it for 15 days? It turns out that this is the oddest thing. In the United States, there is a kind of 100-mile thickening of the border. If you are apprehended as somebody in this 100-mile <coughs> thickening of the border, you won't get the same treatment as somebody else who's seeking asylum who's further in. You can be apprehended, put into detention without much of a basis, and put into something called expedited removal. <coughs> if you are apprehended within 100 miles of the US border, on the US southern side, border. southern border, on the US, well, up, operates yeah, both but, borders, but within the United States, for 15 days. So that's why, apparently, we have this 15-day rule on the Canadian side, except we don't have a 100-mile thick, or, like, this applies in principle across Canada, which is just, it doesn't actually make a lot of sense, and I'm just mentioning it here as a kind of illustration of the, the carelessness, mm -hmm. the lack of care um, about, at, about migration law, making it actually make sense. How do you judge 
the first day to the 15th day. There's no, like, no one's been able to explain that as far as I can. Yeah. It, it's discretionary. I mean, this is also part of what we've been talking about is, is the discretion, right, that is built into the system. So, I think if there's suspicion, if there's, you know. And then what kind of process no proof, accompanies exactly. that? Yeah, and there's who? no clear evidence. So much of it appears to be about messaging. And mm -hmm. to, to what your point earlier, when the journalist was asking, well, can't we just keep people out? That's almost literally what Canadian politicians are saying. So when you wonder, like, how are journalists so dumb? And journalists, as I know, can be dumb. Um, they're also reflecting what they're hearing from their leaders. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the whole point of the Safe Third Country Agreement is to just keep people from claiming asylum. Mm -hmm. um, so Canada is very much involved in, in that endeavor. Um, are there more questions? Hello. Uh, also want to thank you all very, very much. Really informative and your, your personal stories are really very remarkable. And I wanted to ask you as a journalist who covers this beat, you work for, you know, an internationally renowned uh, news organization. What are the challenges <coughs> you face in covering these stories. We talk about trying to combat dehumanization and mobilizing the public. And is it too complicated to explain in a news story? Do your editors not care? Do they think the audiences or readers don't care? Is mainstream media no longer trusted? What are the, some of the challenges you face as someone who's been covering this story for a long time, who knows a lot about it? What are the challenges you have in getting stories you'd like to report on out there into the public you have a few hours <laughs> um listen I'm, I'm incredibly lucky to be working as a journalist and to be working covering migration among other things as a journalist so i don't want to take that for granted um the challenges are significant in part because as we've heard today um the stories are complicated and one of the biggest dangers i think is um of falling into tropes tropes around crises tropes around influxes around floods of migrants. There's been a lot of talk about language that tends to conflate human movement with inanimate objects, um, like water, you know, like, like, uh, you know, animal migration, um, which sounds so obscene when I say it out loud, but it exists, those conflations. Um, so I think the danger of falling into tropes is one of the biggest ones because it's so easy uh, to, to do. I think explaining complex things, I mean, I've been covering the Safe Third Country Agreement for years, and I've been covering it for a news organization that reports on Canada as a foreign country. Um, this is how it operates. So it's, you know, covering complex court cases and complex legislative frameworks um, and bilateral agreements in a way that both conveys, in a way that doesn't make it an abstraction is incredibly challenging. Um, but I think that's true for most journalism is that we run the risk so frequently of failing to adequately humanize our stories. And I'm guilty of that all the time. Um, so that's something I try every day to get better at. I'm sure our brilliant colleagues here could you know, give us some advice. I hope. Don't use the word illegal. Mm -hmm. don't especially in the state of the union yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just, just don't do it um but i you know i think it's very hard because these are often complicated stories to tell mm -hmm. and the audience is often one who is also mm -hmm. being stoked by you know, political messaging it, there's a real fantasy around sovereignty right mm -hmm. the, the idea People who know that you can't seal borders are people who work for IRCC and CBSA. Like, they actually know that, and they talk about, you know, they recognize that. But no politician can afford to admit that you can't hermetically seal the border, because that sounds like um, a kind of concession of failure, because what it means to be sovereign is that you control your border. And so that's constantly being churned out there. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's, a, it's a fantasy but it's a fantasy that has material and lethal effects. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's a problem for journalists and it's a problem. And, and if you challenge it, then you, what you get is, oh, you must be for open borders. And then that's a, a PR disaster for a politician, right? 
So I, I think it's a really mm -hmm. challenging thing. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I, I don't envy journalists as well. I think for a lot of, I mean, it's. I also think the the pace is, is something that we in academia have like the exact opposite problem, <laughs> you know, which is that we can't get our stuff out, you know, to stay relevant. But the the flip side is, I think there is a there's a sort of an urgency and a pace that things are often. But one of the you know to to your point, Audrey, about you know the ways in which politicians can say things without actually being accountable for it or actually having to do. The actual implementation. I mean, I one of the things that that really struck me was that you know with with now potentially you know a, a, the potential of Trump you know at our border again, uh, something you know we should try to avoid and, and keep out ideally. Uh, you know the the head of DHS, the Department of Homeland Security in the U.S., came out saying this is fantasy. You know his policies are insane. You know and this is not a progressive. This is not a you know said so this is. What, what do you want us to do? This is complete fabrication. This is impossible to do. So I think, you know, uh, finding those ways to even challenge, uh, because too often I think political statements are taken as given in the journalistic. So I think that's one, you know, challenging those things mm -hmm. of like, are, what, what are you even talking about? This is not, you know, this is fantasy. This is not doable. What, you know, and, and taking that not just from academics, because frankly, most people don't listen to academics, uh, but from even, you know, the people who have to implement these, you know, and also the, you know, for instance, now all of this talk around, you know, crime in the United States in particular and migrant crime, you know, looking at the data, you know, pushing like, is it, you know, what is, is it in its, you know, migrant crime is, is disproportionately less than, than, than citizen crime, whatever we want to categorize it, you know, like, you know, <clears throat> questioning those things and, and not just sort of printing them as fact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I should note, in the interest of full disclosure, that question came from my father. Um, <laughs> I did not plant it. I did not orchestrate that. But I wanted to note, in case anybody wonders later. <laughs> I'm sorry, you had a question. Thank you all very much for a wonderful panel. My name is Kiba Shaf. I'm a PhD candidate um, at York University. And I was actually quite struck by your last comment, um, Audrey about sovereignty and the utilization of that discourse. Um, my research has been on the impact of European um, externalized or outsourced border controls in North Africa. And it's interesting to see, for me to see North African states that they use that term of sovereignty to resist kind of as a way of resisting EU externalization because they're saying this is infringing on our sovereignty. And for me, it's always interesting to see the dilemma that they're in in that you know they are interested, you know, many, so, Many of them have signed the Refugee Convention. They're interested in this international legitimacy and in upholding their rights regarding asylum. But they are very concerned about this being instrumentalized for the containment of refugees and migrants that they see as an offloading of European responsibility. So what can you say about kind of that dilemma that these states are in? And I, I you know, Turkey, Mexico, there are many of these states that have, are in different stages of this type of situation and positionality. And I think some states learn from others and how they've addressed it, but I don't know if you've any, any all three of you know if you have any um, thoughts on that positionality as well. Um, you know, I, I can start, mm -hmm. but I don't want to take up all the space, really. Um, so I'm also working on these externalization agreements, and one of the things that I, you know, as Lama was talking about, essentially, um, European states are paying a lot of money to these countries to um, develop border infrastructure, and they call it development, mm -hmm. or they call it governance, mm -hmm. because after all, what makes you more of a sovereign than your capacity to control borders, right? So we're going to help you develop your governance capacity by pouring a ton of money into you to control your borders, but really for us. Mm -hmm. And so there is a way in which, going back, I think, to the discussion about coloniality, this is a kind of the ultimate subversion of sovereignty, right? That if sovereignty subsists in the power to control your borders in your own national interest, what is more of, a, a, of an antithesis of sovereignty than having to control your borders in the service of somebody else's borders? Right? It's not in. It's certainly not in Niger's interest 
to be stopping people from moving through Niger. It's not in Libya's interest. Well, it's hard to talk about Libya, as, mm -hmm. but whatever. It's not in Libya, Tunisia. It's not in any, you know, Morocco. It's not in any of their interest to be doing the border work of Europe for Europe mm -hmm. and to pay them off and call it sovereignty, mm -hmm. I think, is a, is a kind of irony mm -hmm. that, that is worth acknowledging. Yeah, uh, I have a question. Uh, my name is Anna Trendafilido. I hold the Canada Excellence Researcher at TMU and a friend of Audrey. <laughs> very, thank you all for a uh, very interesting discussion Oops. and particularly <laughs> a big thanks to the mm -hmm. two testimonies. And I know the shoe project and I was really happy to hear about it. I have two questions, I mean, two, two real questions. One is what is the role of courts? And in relation to what you mentioned about Italy, actually it's the Cassation Court of Italy. Um, that condemned the captain um, for actually bringing back to the Libyan Coast Guard back in 2018, 101 migrants that were stranded in an unworthy dinghy. He's been condemned to one year of imprisonment that he's not going to serve, but it is a very strong symbolic um, decision. So what is, and, and we've seen many of those decisions. Um, so what is the role of courts in your view in, as we see, because coming to this event, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering myself, like, is, is Islam changing and in what ways? I don't think it's the end, but in what ways is it changing? And my other question is in relation mostly to the asylum, the reform of the asylum policy in the U.S. and the effort to have, um, how can I say, appointments regulated, because that refers to the discussion um, about visas for asylum. I'm not a lawyer, but to the best of my understanding, there's no country that gives visa to come apply for asylum. So people have to either enter the border or yeah, come with a um, tourist visa, business visa, whatever visa. Sometimes people don't need a visa. Um, and the country or the, some organizations, you, you probably know um, religious organizations in Europe have tried to create the small humanitarian corridors. But I think the question is, it's a bit the survival of the fittest. If you can make it to our border, you're going to get asylum likely but only the fittest will make it, only those who have resources. So the, the question for me is, is can, can we see, like I think the US is doing a big experiment. I've heard mixed views about what happens in Mexico about this famous app. So if you have any thoughts. Somebody else start, because I feel like I'm talking too much. <laughs> I don't, I can't talk about course no. though. Okay. Uh, I can talk about course. You can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I thank you for Anna. Uh, thank you for being here for the questions and thank you for, for recalling that case better than I did. I like, I remembered it roughly, but uh, yes, I, I, I mean, I'm a political scientist, so I, and there's a lawyer on the panel who could talk about the role of courts. I, uh, you know, I, I hold a lot of hope in courts and maybe that's because I'm not a lawyer <laughs> and I haven't gone through the, but I, I, you know, I, I, you know, both, you know, we know this historically in Europe, not just in the case of refugees, but in the case of immigrant rights more broadly, the courts have played pivotal roles, right? I think, and I think, and I come back to this time again, I feel like I'm a, it's a bit of a broken record now for me, but, you know, if the law didn't matter, states just would push people out. You know, they would not, it's, it's, it's costly. It's not costless to try to make this Rwanda agreement. It's not costless to make, you know, there are the, it, the, the sort of evidence for me that law matters is the great deal of effort that states <clears throat> do to circumvent law. You know, that's the sort of, and, and so I, and I do think, and we have, you know, cases in Canada, we have cases elsewhere where the law makes a difference. And, and I, and I sort of, I hold a lot of hope in that and I admire the work of lawyers in this space a lot. Um, on the sort of, uh, on the, CBP one app or the, I'm also watching this kind of very closely and very um, curious uh, and, and skeptical, I think, as we should always be of, of state action in this domain, but also of, you know, to Angelica's point earlier, like also the role of private actors here and how much of the data, I mean, I'm not, there's still so little that's come out, it, you know, what are the data privacy issues here? There's all kinds of questions that come up. Uh, but I think it's trying to address a question that in my work, I come back to a lot, which is that the, the, 
the thing that uh, often we're responding to is not necessarily uh, a crisis of of people. It's it's a it's a crisis of perception of order, mm -hmm. and 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 I think order making <laughs> is sort of part of what the work of you know having people applaud and and even if it doesn't work, <laughs> just telling people that now there's a system and people are going through a system and that's what we're doing, I think can alleviate a lot of this. And, you know, that may be a good outcome. You know, if it can bring down the pressure in terms of the rhetorical narrative around a crisis at the border, that may not be a bad outcome. Because I do think that that has all kinds of negative knock-on effects in communities and, you know, and, <clears throat> but, but it may be more nefarious than that. Um, and, and I think we'll have to wait and see, at least yeah. for my end. So I'll just talk about the courts part. Because uh, I, or do you want me to not? Yeah, yeah, no, no, I'll just say, because uh, I, I don't have a lot of knowledge about how the app is, is working, and although I agree with your point about order. But on courts, so um, courts, I think, <clears throat> Uh, do important work, so I don't want to suggest otherwise, and maybe that's because I have a self-interest in that because I spend so much time working on it. But it also, I think um, it's important to recognize that by dint of the way cases come up, courts are typically rear guard. You're going to court to fight a rear guard action. You're trying to stop something bad that the government is doing. It's not a very good vehicle for trying to advance in a positive direction. That's not the court's fault. I'm just pointing out the limits of, of what courts can do. The other thing about courts, and I noticed this perhaps more in, in Canada and, and constitutional places, is that it is often easier to make arguments that are not explicitly about human rights. To make, and what I mean are arguments that say the government is not allowed to do this because it violates a fundamental right under the charter. Mm -hmm. It's actually often harder to do that than to make a technical argument under administrative law that, you know, you can do what you want. You're the parliament, you're supreme, but this has not been done in the proper way. And you can often go quite far on that, down that road, and further down that road than you can get by doing a frontal assault on the legitimacy of the law as a human rights violation. And why is that? Well, you know, I'm, I think it is because I don't know that people who are migrants, who are non-citizens, who are asylum seekers or refugees, basically anything to do with the border, no matter what the law says, courts have a very hard time dealing with this as a matter of right that actually people who are seeking to come into Canada or to remain in Canada are rights bearers. And that when certain things are done to them, you are violating their rights. I think courts, rather like society at large, is much more comfortable with the idea that we can do what we want and we're gonna choose to do the right thing here or the nice thing or the better thing or the fairer thing, but only in a context that makes it clear that we could choose otherwise and it would be lawful because we're in charge of who comes in. And it goes back to this, my concern about the, the overweening role that a particular conception of sovereignty plays in how we regulate uh, the movement of people across borders. One thing I will say though, and correct me if I'm misapprehending, but it was a Canadian court that said asylum seekers are covered under the charter in the 80s, right? So in, at least in theory, they have protection. And that's thanks to the courts. The question is whether Canadian courts are adequately enforcing that protection by like, I think you could argue about the capaciousness of their interpretation of the protection. But in theory, at least, courts have said asylum seekers are covered by Canada's Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So indeed, there's the high water mark of Canadian constitutional jurisprudence for refugee claimants was a case called Singh, where the court said everyone who is at least physically in Canada, and by virtue of that, subject to the charter, has the protect, subject to Canadian law, has the protection of the charter. So that was the high water mark. People were extraordinarily hopeful. It's kind of been downhill ever since. Um, so that people, unlike frankly in the United States, it's not nothing. I, so I, I, I'm glad you mentioned it, and it's not nothing at all. But um, they, they are protected by the charter, 
but the quality or the quantum of protection that they get is, seems to be calibrated or diminished, frankly, by the fact that they're non-citizens. So, so there's a question of, yeah, you get the protection of the charter, but what does that protection actually mean for you is very much shaped by the fact that they aren't citizens. But it's not nothing, and, and you're absolutely right to, to say that. Um, hi, my name is Sabrina. Um, I'm a criminology student at York University. So I know we touched upon really quickly about the criminalization of migrants and non-citizens in the country. And I'm wondering, like, how do we combat that narrative of seeing migrants as inherently suspicious, inherently criminal, inherently dangerous? How can we like change how we see them as actual victims of systems that are not working instead of threats to the country? Is it enough to humanize them? And then I guess the second part to that question is, is it really enough to humanize and like share the stories of migrants? Like how do we actually get people to care? Because I'm sure there are people that have been exposed to these stories, but they just don't care because of course they're just focused on their own lives and their own problems. So how do we really make change? That's my question. Easy question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you were saying it's enough. Well, we are seeing that it takes a lot to recognize that someone is a human being as we are, has the same rights as we do. So I think it takes a lot. We are still very far from doing that. Um, but I also think, you know, talking about stories, we were talking about stories and um, Anna, you were asking advice. And I think it depends also how we tell the story and for whom. Um, we, I was talking yesterday to my students who were talking about allyship and what we notice is that when someone wants to be an ally, often speaks for someone. So it means take the story away from the subject. And so, especially for us in academia, we can do research on anything, but we need to position ourselves, so positionality. So even when we tell someone else's story, inevitably we are filtering that story we are changing words we are interpreting what the person is telling us and so i think you know um, when someone is telling us a story we have an immense responsibility to give justice to that story and so sometimes rather than speaking for the other the migrant well let's do a step away and let's give the platform to the person telling us their own experience with their own words. I think this is an incredible, incredible act of humanization. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Are there any more questions? Listen, thank you all so much for coming. Um, it's been such an honor to be here. Thank you to our participants. You guys are brilliant. And I feel so, so privileged to share space with you and share time with you. Um, your insights have been so valuable. And we're all very lucky to have you. So thank you so much. Thank you. Anna.